the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are Struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night? None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You We fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Indescribable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful and untamable, all struggle we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Unconceivable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable and unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart. You love me the same. You are amazing. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. And you see the depths of our hearts, and you love us the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Good morning. It's a lovely day to come together in worship of our Lord, and I think there are some new people here, maybe. You'll have to excuse me if um, I don't introduce myself if you're new, because I'm new. So um, I don't know every face. I'm pretty sure I've asked two people who've been coming here for over 40 years if they're new, so <laughs> I stopped asking that a while ago. So please, if you're new, feel free to come up to me and say hello and let me know who you are so I can just get to know you. And I actually just found out during our uh, funeral time that uh, we have visitor bags uh, in those little baskets up there, and I thought that was 
really special. So please consider grabbing one if you are new. Just a few little announcements. Uh, the men's Bible study is meeting tomorrow, Monday evening at 6.30. Uh, we are currently studying the book of Genesis, and we meet the second and fourth Monday of each month at 6.30. So come and enjoy learning God's word, and that is held in the friendship room, which is downstairs in the back, the same room where the consistory meets on Tuesdays. Also, please continue to be in prayer for uh, the Baker family. I had the pleasure of uh, doing the funeral with Pastor uh, Dennis Tapp, and um, I thought that went quite well. But, uh, of course, that family is still grieving, so please keep them in your prayers, um, especially Jim right across the road there. Delois's son, uh, of course, lived with her for many, many years, and his life, as uh, Pastor Brian mentioned to me, I mean, that's, that's changed, and he has... Uh, a very different road ahead. So please keep him in your prayers. Are there any other announcements? Will you please pray with me? Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O oh God, in your loving kindness and your great compassion. Cleanse us from our sin. Please just take a moment of silence to reflect on your own personal sins and Give them to the Lord. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord declares that your sins are forgiven. And now let's please rise to greet one another in the name of the Lord. Can you do me a favor?
You may be seated. Before we go into the second article of the Belgic Confession, uh, some people have been asking about my office hours and um, kind of at a weird point with this transition. Um, my lovely son, Leif, uh, is quite a handful and unfortunately we don't have any daycare plans um, ongoing until, I believe, March, although Heather said that might be coming sooner, uh, but we're See her shaking her head. Well, we're working on it, but needless to say that um, I don't have set office hours quite yet. They'll be coming soon, but I want you all to know I am still very accessible. If you come down to the office and I'm not there, um, I'm sure Joan would be happy to fly down and I'll, oh, I'm cutting in and out. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll be happy to come over to the church or meet you in my home or... Um, <laughs> down at the coffee shop, whatever works. I want you to know, and of course you can call me. You have my cell number, it should be on the bulletin. So don't feel like because um, I'm not sitting in the church that you aren't welcome to just talk to me or call me or figure something out. So I just want you all to know that. Today we're reading Article 2 in the Belgic Confession, the means by which we know God. We know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe. Since that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. God's eternal power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.20. All these things are enough to convict humans and to leave them without excuse. Second, God makes himself known to us more clearly by his holy and divine word, as much as we need in this life for God's glory and for our salvation. Amen. Now, I don't think I said last time why necessarily I was reading the Belgic Confession or what these are. Uh, our standards of faith. I think I alluded to them, but I didn't really talk much about that. And I don't want to go into a big diatribe. That's uh, not the, it's not the day today to do that. But that is to say, is a lot of people, I think, have this understanding of what, why do we need creeds and confessions? All we need is the Bible. And in a sense, that's right. The, the Bible is our sole infallible source of faith in the Christian church. And so these Creeds, these confessions, like the Belgic Confession here, are merely a biblical summary of what the Bible already says. It's in some ways no different than when I come up here. You wouldn't say, well, why is Pastor Zach preaching 
we have the Bible. Let's just read the Bible. Well, I'm, I'm expositing the word, right? And that's what these creeds and confessions are. They are statements of faith that tell the community at large what it is that we believe in, what we affirm as believers in the Reformed faith. And that's all they are. And of course, if you ever have any questions about that stuff, again, feel free to reach out to me. Hear now the word of the Lord from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes me with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak, for you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's message will probably be a good starting point to give you all a uh, future outlook on how to uh, best understand my, my sermons. Uh, there are a lot of pastors out there with different styles of rhetoric, of messages, of intentions when they preach. Some are topical, some may be overtly political. Hope I avoid that. Some weave pop culture into their sermons. Some preach nothing but hellfire and damnation, hammering in how sinful we all are. Now, I'll leave you all to figure out some of that stuff, uh, to figure out how it is that I preach, since I think I do a little bit of it all, but I hope that at the very least I'm thoroughly biblical and through the hope and fidelity endowed to us through the Holy Spirit, I can give the Word of God as much as we possibly hope to understand it. And as I mentioned before, sometimes that will necessarily offend and indeed, sometimes it should offend, even though, even, uh, I'm sorry, even those of us who are already here. <clears throat> but more what I wanted to say, since I think I already talked about that point, is that sometimes we look for things in Scripture that are not there. The Bible is somehow both paradoxically simple, yet overwhelmingly complex. It is filled with all kinds of different genres, composed by different authors from different contexts. There's a lot going on in those pages. But please know that when I'm standing up here behind the pulpit, my goal, my intention is to provide an explanation of what the author intends to tell us. And sometimes it doesn't entail always a practical lesson that we can take away, but more or less gives us a way to guide us as we travel through the windy pages of the Bible. That is to say, 
try to see the forest for the trees. The big picture, rather than asking continually, are we there yet? Or maybe getting too distracted at a particular point and not carrying forward. Bring this up because I think a lot of the time people get a little too focused on the lessons that aren't immediately there. And often if we force practicality into each and every single verse, we increase the chance at getting an obscured, warped message. We always need to remember not to read into the Bible, but try to read out of it what it is that the, again, author intended. Practical lessons will come to be sure. The Bible is rife full of these, but we can only do so much reading of the Word in one Sunday morning, so it may take a little while before we get there. And if anything, this should just be more encouragement to you all as Christians that we aren't merely to just hear the Word on Sunday mornings, but as is written in the Psalms, that we should store the Word in our hearts that we might not sin against the Lord. And that goes for me as well. Now, last week we focused on verses 1 through 18 in chapter 1 of John. And I would say that uh, this first section was more of a mystical, broad nature rather than the relatively simple biographical narrative that we get in the other gospel accounts. But then we break into verse 19 and it transitions smoothly into the narrative that is shared somewhat similarly in the other gospel accounts, which is concerning John the Baptist. John is in the midst of baptizing people in the Jordan, and he is visited by what seems to be representatives of the Pharisees. And unlike the other gospel accounts, the gospel of John gives us this unique dialogue. Who are you? Might be getting a little Alice in Wonderland from that. I don't know. Remember that, the caterpillar? Who are you? That's, I think that's why I'm saying it that way. But um, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed... I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. There's a bit more to this conversation, but I want to point out this particular sentence because it's very fascinating when we consider it in contrast to the words of Christ himself in Matthew 11 when he said, If you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah. Who is to come. So why is it then that Christ is saying John the Baptist is Elijah and in this different narrative in the book of John, John the Baptist is saying to the Jewish authorities, I'm not Elijah, no. Who's right? Is it John or is it Jesus? Not all at once. No, I'm joking. Excuse me. The answer is both. And how we get there is because they are both answering in different ways. Consider when Jesus Christ is referred to as the final, the last, the ultimate, or the second Adam. If someone were to ask Jesus, are you Adam? He could very well say no, because he's he's not Adam. Because when Jesus is called the second Adam, he is not literally a copy of Adam or the reincarnation of Adam, but Adam is used as a reference Because as Paul writes, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. This is what is sometimes called in biblical studies as the law of double reference, if you want a technical name to it. So when the Jewish authorities ask John the Baptist, are you Elijah? John says, no, because he's not Elijah, at least not literally But when Jesus says he is Elijah who is to come, he is drawing a direct comparison to the spirit and role of Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament. John the Baptist isn't described by his physical appearance in the Gospel of John. So if we only rely on this narrative, this particular illusion may be lost on us. But he is described in both the books of Mark and Matthew as wearing clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food consisting of locusts and wild honey. Food that would have been synonymous with someone living in the wilds on the move. And how is Elijah the prophet described? He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist. And while Elijah wasn't said to have eaten locusts and wild honey specifically, 
He similarly lived off the land at one point being helped in his journey, commanded by the Lord as he drank from brooks and ate food that was supplied by ravens. There are other similarities, of course, but these physical ones should at least draw your attention to Christ's ultimate point in this comparison when he said in Matthew 11, verse 10, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. This verse is so particularly relevant because there's so much going on here and I, I, I really sincerely absolutely love this verse. Let me read it just one more time. Really just sort of sink your teeth into it. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. So in other words, Christ is saying, I'm me I am sending my messenger, John, before you. And before we get back to the Gospel of John, because this verse is, of course, relevant there, know these words from Malachi 3.1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And who is that in verse 3 1 in Malachi? Who's that about? It's about the prophet Elijah. Now, recall the verses from last week. And if you know me, you'll know I get super pumped about these texts, especially in the face of people who say things like, Jesus never said he was God. Nowhere in the Bible did he say that. But what does it say in John verse 6? There was a man sent from God whose name was was John. So Christ is saying in Matthew, Behold, I send my messenger. And in both Malachi, which is what he was referencing in John 1, verse 6, we see the person sending Elijah identified with John the Baptist later as being sent from God. Not only is this verse identifying Elijah with John the Baptist, but Christ is identifying himself with God. It's a very important point because I hear it all the time. Nowhere in the Bible does Christ say that he's God. Well, he says it multiple times, but like everything else he says, he doesn't say it necessarily explicitly. He doesn't wave his arm up and down saying, I'm God. And John the Baptist answers these questions, which are in essence saying, who are you that you think you can perform this religious ritual if you aren't Elijah or the Savior? And John answers by saying, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Something to add to the context here is that what John was doing would have been considered particularly abhorrent to firm Orthodox believing Jews at the time. Because what John was doing was baptizing Jews in the way that you would have baptized Gentile converts that would have been converting to Judaism. It was very important to Jewish identity that they were set apart from the Gentiles. So to have someone who was baptizing Jews in the same way that he was baptizing Gentiles, that would have been considered highly gross and offensive to them. But John the Baptist clarifies that he is merely leading the way to the true work of the Son. His baptism may cleanse and prepare, but that the journey of a lifelong cleansing could only come through Jesus Christ, the Savior. And he follows this up in the next day by saying, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. He again reaffirms that he was leading the way for Christ. And then Jesus, as the Christ, is revealed to John. If we recall from the other gospel accounts, Jesus asked John to baptize him. And John is at first confused, saying, It should be you that baptizes me. Remember, John says multiple times, I'm not even fit to, to untie your shoes, much less baptize you. 
But eventually he acquiesces, and upon Jesus' baptism, he bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And then, he whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. For those of you who have a very in-depth memory of Scripture, you may recall a very visceral illustration of John's point here. In Acts 19, the Apostle Paul is at Ephesus and he encounters some disciples and says to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And Paul then asked, And to what then were you baptized? To which they answer, John's baptism. But what Paul says here is especially relevant. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, foreshadowing the coming of Jesus in whom you were to believe. And so Paul then baptizes them in the name of Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them. My friends, these final words from the book of Acts should serve as a warning. The followers, dedicated as they were, thought that they were a sufficient, at a sufficient point. Um, to use a turn of phrase, they were good to go with John's baptism. But they weren't even aware of the Holy Spirit. And when they were informed of what they were missing, and they accepted this, their salvation was demonstrated by the Holy Spirit coming upon them. The warning is then this. We should not be always quick to assume that because we come to church, because we've heard the name of Christ, because we call ourselves Christians, that these things are sufficient, that they're enough. We are saved through the power and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord through his death and resurrection, yes. But to quote someone much more learned, learned than myself, yes, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Know your Bibles. Know the Word. As I said from the book of Psalms, keep it close to your heart. Know what it means to truly call yourselves Christians, followers of Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. say it once, I'll say it twice. Our offerings, offering plate stuff is in the back. Are we ever going to bring that back? Maybe we should talk about that. Do people want it back? I don't know. We'll figure that out. But in the meantime, that's where it is. So we appreciate your tithes and authoring. Uh, authoring? Offering. Getting tongue-tied. See, this is why I drink all that water, because I start getting tongue-tied. <laughs> Friends, will you please put... Uh, Please pray with me. O oh Lord and Father of the household of faith, as we thank you for the gifts of these people to the ministry of your work. We also thank you for the gift of faith worked within us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for having called us to yourself, for consecrating us to your service, for having us set apart to the sacred ministry of prayer. O oh Lord and Father of the household of faith, we pray for the church and all her breadth and variety, gathered out of every nation, family, people, and tongue, to be a kingdom of priests serving you. We pray for the church and all the world, for churches in North America, Europe, and the Middle East, for the churches in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, for young churches and old churches, small churches and large churches, weak churches and strong churches. Grant to the church true lowliness, and genuine humility where there is pride, unity, where there is division. Grant to her truth where there is error and wisdom, where there is folly, that you might fulfill your purposes for her. And as we pray for the church, we also pray for those outside the church, young or old, sick or healthy, rich or poor, those in grief. Please be with them and display the fruits of your Son in whose heavenly name we pray. 
Jesus Christ. Amen. doxology together.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you for singing with me. Go in peace.